Dr. Brennan, why do we need sleep? It's fascinating what is now coming to be known about sleep. The last 20 years has seen immense progress because of the amazing instruments that have now been developed which can follow the activities of the brain during the process of sleeping. And in, in truth, we need more sleep than we think we need. All the research is pointing to a minimum of eight hours sleep that people actually need for the work that the brain needs to do overnight to be accomplished. Less sleep leaves us less capable even if we don't know it. Even an hour's lack of sleep over a 10 day period leaves us as incompetent and incapable cognitively as if we had missed a whole night's sleep for one night. The only difference is we don't recognize it, we don't know it. So it takes eight hours for the system to totally shut down overnight. And if we don't have the full eight hours, we never totally switch off our sympathetic nervous system, which is the one for fight and flight and wear and tear. And therefore, we wear ourselves out prematurely because the body never gets relief from that system. But with eight hours sleep, it is switched off. So this is considered to be one of the reasons why the lack of a full night's sleep contributes to such common and devastating conditions as heart disease and strokes and diabetes. And now the greatest plague to hit mankind in this time, obesity. And the reason obesity is uh, af, um, an outcome of insufficient sleep is that during the night if you get a full night's sleep you, mm, you mellow your sleep your, your appetite and digestive hormones if you don't get a full night's sleep you don't switch off the hormone that tells you hungry so that you're constantly feeling a hunger you you don't switch on properly the hormone that tells you you've had enough to eat so you don't recognize when you've had enough to eat and more than that without a full eight hour sleep you will naturally choose unhealthy processed foods over healthy foods the experiment shows that if people have a good night's sleep they go for the good foods, they have a, not a sufficient sleep, the same people will make the choices in the other direction for bad foods. Now can I just ask you a question here? I mean we all kind of get an idea of what are good foods and what are not good foods. And when you say um, not good foods you're talking about highly processed, um, refined carbohydrates. Exactly. Um, is, is, why is that choice made and what is what would you consider a good food? I think organic to cooked um, vegetables, grains, pulses, good fruits, not seeds are all good foods but um, a processed food is you know a white bread, um, uh, shop-bought convenience meals that are laced with preservatives and colorings and flavorings and um, but they have the sugar hit. It's the and, sugar that and people may, are craving because of the lack of sleep. It may well be that mm. sugar hit and I mean that's very unfortunate because the sugar hit stresses the body and actually may contribute to. Is, is it the immediate need for energy that you get when you're because of the lack of sleep there's a lack of energy possibly so it's interesting then to look at what's going on during the night as you sleep and particularly with reference to what Ayurveda always had to say 
because Ayurveda says the Pitta or transformative processes come in between 10 and 2 and Vata comes in between 2 and 6. So what the sleep research is showing now is that between 10 and 2 a system in the brain called the glymphatics comes into play and the glymphatics is made of glial cells and during these first four hours the glial cells shrink dramatically to 60, less than 60 percent even down to 40 percent of their normal size and so that opens up channels throughout the brain which now flushes brain fluid through the brain at 20 times the natural flow which is like a power hose cleaning up all the debris from around the nerve cells. And so all that is cleaning out the brain for, you know, better function the following day. At the same time, the um, recent memories from the day's experience, which are in the lower part of the brain called the hippocampus on both sides, one on each side, that gets transmitted up to the cerebral cortex, the top of the brain, for permanent storage. So we're transferring short-term to long-term memories during this four hours. And um, that would be all in terms of Pitta from an Ayurveda point of view, the, the renewal, the transformation back to a balanced state. And Pitta is involved with processing the memories. So that would all be in terms of Pitta. Now, the next four hours are equally important and equally necessary for, for us to sleep because we're now moving from deep sleep, stage three and four sleep, which we have a lot more of in the first four hours. And in the second four hours, we're moving more towards dream sleep, REM sleep, which you know is much more prominent in this four hours. And during this time, the memories that you have put in place into long-term memories now get integrated with life's experience. And out of that process comes your capacity to see patterns, to understand the holistic perspective of it, and to become very creative with it, and to have fresh insights, which is much more a Vata phenomena. And the other thing that happens during these four hours is that the limbic system, which is the base of your, the basis for your emotion, the location for emotion in the brain, the limbic system has begun to act on its own after a day's activity. And the channels connecting it to the frontal part of your brain, who is the managing director, if you like, they get disrupted. But this last four hours of sleep sorts out that connection so that the frontal areas of your brain are remaining in charge of your emotions. If you haven't got the full four hours, however, you're going to be a little bit more primitive in your emotional responses, uh, a little bit um, more emotionally labile and uh, possessed by your emotions rather than having the emotion integrated by the frontal portions of the brain. So again, we see how significant it is to get that work done so that during the day to come, we have a good emotional IQ and more creativity and a clearly functioning nervous system which has been balanced by a good night's sleep and a settled sympathetic nervous system so that we're not getting increasingly excited. So, all these discoveries as to the great and amazing work that goes on in our nervous system overnight, it's a very busy act of time of renewal and replenishment and integration um, of our experience. So scientists would be very interested in this idea of um, the pitta sleep and the vata sleep because those hours between 10 o'clock at night, mm. six o'clock in the morning, which Ayurveda emphasizes trying to get to bed mm. before 10, so that we're asleep by 10 o'clock. Mm. And then we have those four hours between 10 and two, mm. doing that kind of purification 
and also mm -hmm. processing, which are the two functions of pitta. Yes. And we're then doing the integrative type of um, associations mm -hmm. during the two hour, two o'clock until six o'clock, which is the vata time. And that, that phase, the sympathetic nervous system is getting more and more switched off. Yes. Which means more and more settled and relaxed So you need all that period of time for that to happen. Yes. Those, at least those eight hours. Yes. Yes. Mm. And that's why, you know, it is a very um, critical issue that our culture doesn't get enough sleep. People aren't performing. They mm. may think they are, but they're not performing anywhere near their potential. Um, they're leaving themselves open to um, uh, poor responses and, um, and mistakes and accidents. Because without the eight hours, then people start to catnap through the day for three to five second periods. Mm -hmm. And they don't even realize it's happening, but they have gone asleep. And that is now considered to be a far more significant cause of road traffic accidents than alcohol. And it's recognized that at least if you're drunk and driving, you may have some attempt at a rescue at the last minute to prevent the accident, which lessens its impact whether you've managed to get the slow moving foot onto the brake. But with sleep, there's no response. So the accidents happen 20 miles an hour faster. So it's just one, you know, area in which we see that the lack of full sleep and the recognition of the need for us to have eight hours is having a huge impact culturally. Um, it's also interesting to recognize how, you know, much sleep is disrupted in our culture. For many people who hear all of these great works that go on during sleep, you know, up to maybe one third of people at some point are insomniac or sleep disturbed, and then they think, well, you know, I can't sleep. And that, I think there's a number of features in our culture that contribute. The sleep specialists will point to the reality that um, traditionally we didn't have light, and the lack of light became the trigger for our melatonin, which, you know, after dusk started to climb so that the melatonin would switch us off into sleep come 10 o'clock. And that no longer exists for us because of all the ambient light that we've created. And particularly light in the blue spectrum which is the lowest energy light, which is the one that therefore your phones and your computers operate efficiently on. They switch off your melatonin. So people, even if they get to sleep, having used computers or mobile phones before bed, the quality of their sleep has been interrupted. So that's one reason for disturbed sleep. And another reason is it used to be after dusk, the temperature dropped. And that temperature drop is a natural precursor for sleep and brings on sleep. And so uh, with our central heating systems, we never tend to have any more that temperature drop. So that those natural triggers are absent in our culture, which may be contributing then to, to more sleep problems. But taking it from an Ayurveda point of view, our Vata is totally disrupted because we don't schedule enough rest. So rest and the lack of it at night is going to leave our Vata increased during the day. So we start the day more hyperactive anyway, and we get more hyperactive as the day goes by. And particularly with the fast pace of living and the extremes of, of stimulation, then the Vata is disrupted by about four in the afternoon. And that then causes us to have difficulty getting settling down at night for sleep. And then even if we do, tending to wake up during vata phase of the sleep because vata is too busy and we're waking up. So it's not 
too surprising, considering how we structure our lives, that there would be a lot of sleep disruption. And well, you see, it's a very interesting insight because people think, oh, I have a sleep problem, I'll, sl I'll, I'll pop a tablet. Now, sleeping tablets do not create sleep. What they create is sedation, and sedation is not a replacement for good quality sleep. It just is a sort of a comfort to somebody that they felt while I was unconscious. But being unconscious, unfortunately, is not the same. And so these sleeping tablets are a waste of time in terms of giving you the quality of sleep that you actually need. It gives you some comfort that you were not agitated through the night. That's about what they give you. Do you but they have side effects. What exactly happens with sleeping tablets um, when it comes to the brain? Um, sedation. Sedation is, 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 does that mean that, that, that there's the processing that you would expect and the purification, the flushing of the brain isn't going to be happening because no. the brain isn't active in the way that it should be? Exactly. Mm. Exactly. It's not doing the functions of sleep. Only insofar as some sleep may happen. Some During rest the night. is there in, well, in the muscles, I suppose. No. It must be that we sleep. If we didn't sleep, within six weeks we'd be dead. You know, sleep is that critical that deprives someone of sleep. And it's, you know, the, the Guinness Book of Records have, have now banned people trying to achieve a record for non-sleeping because it's so dangerous. So it's not that even insomniacs don't sleep, they must do. But it's that they don't get enough and they don't feel the quality of it to be deep enough. But still, some of the functions must be happening. But they're not happening through the sleeping tablet. They're happening despite it. And all the sleeping tablet is doing is sort of knocking out our awareness so that we're not consciously tossing and turning all night. And yeah, I accept it's very difficult for people to have to tolerate that discomfort through the night and agitation that they're not sleeping. And, but it's as well to know that you'd be better off using natural approaches to try and quieten you. And you see, that's the problem. People want a pill to go into bed to put them asleep when they've spent the whole day wiring themselves up. And that's why they have to take the whole Ayurvedic perspective into consideration of having as you suggest, a really good routine, because that settles vata, of having restful meals, because that at least gives the body a chance to relax through the day, of uh, doing an oil massage, because that's a very sublime way of quietening and settling and integrating the vata. And the regular TM is one of the best ways of settling vata. And so it's to reach a critical mass of balance for Vata that allows the mind to be able to settle. Um, but Ayurveda recognizes that may be the commonest sleep disturbance, but Pitta can disrupt sleep too. And because we don't, as it were, get sufficient of a temperature drop, or people who are quite Pitta are quite hot in nature, perhaps this is interfering with the depth of their sleep. So they tend to wake up about midnight and so then they need to balance their pitta for proper quality of sleep. And then there's the kapha sleep disrupted, where the quality of sleep is not sufficient to leave one feeling refreshed next morning, but rather very dull, heavy, sluggish, unrefreshed next day. It's a kapha sleep problem. So you have to deal with the vata, the pitta, the kapha for a better overall balance. And then you could start to um, orientate your thinking about how do you support your sleep. Now, it's interesting, um, when I did the other weekend, when uh, we were talking to people on the stall at Albury Edge, and a lot of people talked about the sleep, you know, they talked yeah. about lack of sleep or problems with sleep. And some people were very, very clearly having vata sleep mm -hmm. problems because they would be waking up at uh, anywhere between two, four, early morning. Yeah. And they would um, 
be feeling agitated, not being able to go back to sleep and worried and so on. Yeah. And whenever I've said, oh, you know, you've got a lot of vata, how is your sleep? They say, oh, not so good, and, uh, and yeah. getting up in the early hours. Um, other people were saying, oh, it's round, as you say, it's around about one o'clock in the morning or so on. Yeah. Now, what would be the experience? Sometimes it can be hard to differentiate whether it's a vata or pitta that's causing them to wake up, um, apart it's from the time when they wake up. Um, whether it's midnight or two or four in the morning. Um, what would be the feelings of somebody who was having a lot of pitta um, disruption? Hot. They would be feeling yes. physically hot. They'd wake yeah. up hot. They'd be throwing off blankets. They'd be thinking about getting out for to cool down. Right. Okay, so they would feel quite hot. Um, and... Uh, irritable and um, whereas Vata may be more aware of, of, of actually feeling the cold um, but, it, but the timing is very significant because someone can have two duvets on and wake up hot and still have a Vata problem you know so if the, the bedding is appropriate then at that point the pittas you know should be appropriately you know, soothed in their temperature, but they still themselves feel hot. And the vatas feel cold. Even though they basically have enough bed clothes, they're still cool. Is, is there something about the quality of feelings and emotions as well, which oh, is different yeah. between very somebody who is a vata and somebody who is a pitta and waking up in the middle of the night? Yeah, the, pit, the vata people will always tell you that they just couldn't believe the next morning when they were getting up what they were worried about during the night. It was so illogical, so <laughs> the wall. So that is interesting, how the vata creates all sorts of creative anxieties. To mm, creative obsess, anxieties, that's a good part. Obsessed right, right through the, the, their wakefulness. Um, but Pitta won't have that degree of anxiety and, and, um, uh, and they'll, they'll just be maybe in high. Yes, annoyed that they're not asleep. Yes. Right. Um, I heard somewhere that feelings of energy in the system, just feeling energised, um, would that be a pit of feeling? Um, uh, it's, it's difficult to know because uh, with Vata you can feel hyper excited in the sense of an excessive energy. Um, and uh, I don't know. I'd have to know the quality of the energy and the description of it that they're feeling to make me interpret that. But um, it's a natural function, particularly in a vata time of life, between, you know, over the age of 50 to 60, that vata causes people to wake up and they need to go to the loo. And that's all right, because we have that 90 minute cycle where we go deep, 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 and then we come back up and dream, dream, dream. But we're very superficial. And then we go back into the next cycle of deep sleep. And that takes about 90 minutes. So when people tend to wake up to want to go to the toilet, it's at the top of the cycle. And they can generally just go out to the toilet and get back in the bed and they're straight back to sleep. They don't have a sleep problem. And be particularly aware that caffeine taken in the middle of the afternoon half the caffeine is still in your blood to wake you up at four o'clock in the morning so caffeine should be confined to the morning time for anybody who's any delicacy about sleep and then the rhythm of having that routine where we settle down and we do some quiet activities not television um, and you know the bed the bedroom is neat and comfortable and is used for sleep not for other purposes um, like watching television or studying or something so that the association with the bed is sleep and um, just that evening routine it all is very inducing of, of sleep to have that regularity. Um, what about the eating? Um, a lot of people these days eat their main meal when um, seven eight o'clock in the evening. That's because this society is chasing the money 
and the money is more important than their health. Mm-hmm. And always the tradition was the big meal in the middle of the day, we digest better in the middle of the day, we weren't designed to digest at night. The body is designed to, to heal and clear itself up in the night, but if you're putting in a whole lot of food, you're reflecting the body into digesting and metabolizing all that nourishment at a time when it should be quite opposite, cleaning itself out and removing the toxins for elimination the next morning when we get up. So it's just not wise, not right, not natural. Um, and uh, yeah, but people then complain that that's their social time. You can be social over soup. And uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's just they're in the habit of it and they feel it's right. Well, they might feel it's right if they're in the middle of a pit of time of life and they can get away with it. But as life moves on and their digestion is not as powerful, they will suffer and they will need to change. So, so a good evening meal would just be some vegetable soup and a piece of toast or some crackers or something like that. If someone was hungry. And if they weren't hungry, why are they eating? But generally, something very light in the evening is sufficient. But that's predicated on the reality of a decent, honourable bedtime, mm-hmm. as opposed to an unnatural late night, because Pitta comes up between 10 and 2, and if you're up and about and active, yeah, you'll start to feel hungry again. But it's not a time, actually, for a midnight feast. It's mm-hmm. actually a time for healing and clearing. You ought to have been in bed. But Pitta people will argue to the blue in the face that they're midnight people. But if you took away electricity, they'd discover the word. Because people do go into cycles, don't they, which are un- probably unnatural cycles. Yeah, because Pitta people feel their Pitta come up, they feel energy, they feel vitality. So they want to, you know, become active again. Mm. Because they think that's when they're most creative or whatever. But yeah, they feel all of that internally, but it's not about cleaning the house and, you know, doing a day's work. It's actually about cleaning internally your house and, you know, doing the work of renewal in your own body. That's why you feel the energy and they should go with that. Uh, In the same way, Ayurveda would have suggested if there was a bit of hunger that you'd have a hot milk drink at night because that's very somniferous as well. Uh, that's very particular little nutmeg in a hot milk drink is very soothing for a night's sleep. But it could be chamomile tea, um, and um, there are Ayurvedic herbals specifically for sleep in the Maharishi Ayurveda range. There's the blissful sleep basic, which um, would be the first protocol, and to take one or two of those in the evening. Um, now, it's also refined in that if you recognize you have a vata or a pitta problem with sleep, you can also add in the blissful sleep vata and pitta tablets because they will sort out the vata and pitta. Why take blissful sleep basic oh. along with them? Without different, them? different herbs with a slight different orientation. One is just more settling quietening, integrating, more perhaps switching off the sympathetic nervous system and switching on the parasympathetic. But the other is more nuanced in terms of the doshas. So you're taking a two-pronged approach, really. And the the kapha one is an interesting one because kaphas usually sleep quite solidly. Mm. So the kapha one for sleep, is that to help to purify, the, more to do with the purification process? Um, because people who've got too much kapha, they're often waking up mm. feeling heavy. Mm. Maybe there's amma within the body, too much kapha within the and body. And amma within the mind. Amma you know. within the mind. Yeah, yeah. So it's so more the of herbs. a phase of purification yeah. than, than the uh, herbs. Perhaps. The herbs there will be stimulating the processes of... of, um, of clearing the, to- the, the ama, the toxins, but stimulating... So ama from the brain, ama from the body... And also stimulating the 
the processes of the brain itself to mm. be more lively, you know, mm. lively in the activity necessary during sleep. Because of, of when, when we're talking about purification, it's more than just physical purification, it can be purification of ideas or yes, that and we don't need. When you're thinking, you can't just think in terms of purification. What you also then think of is the agnes or fires which do the cleansing. So you're stimulating metabolisms, not only to purify, but to create more energy. So the herbals in the kapha blend will be more of that vein, either clearing ama, but also stimulating agni, or transformations, or 